Today's episode is sponsored by Dell Air Heating and Cooling. What's up guys? It's been a long time. I'm Randy with Fix My Heat. In today's video, we're going to be doing a deep dive on pressure switches, where they came from, what they're used for, how to find them, and how to measure draft pressure to verify your diagnosis. Stick around to the end of the video for an update on why I haven't posted in a while and some big news for the channel and my life. But let's get right to it. This is going to be a fun one. Pressure switches are used in all sorts of machines. Well pumps, air compressors, aircraft, cars, and obviously your furnace. Pressure switches can be divided into two main categories, pneumatic and hydraulic. Pneumatic switches operate based on vapor or air pressure. Hydraulic switches operate based on liquid pressures. Attempting to measure pressure has been a part of engineering and science as far back as 1594, when Galileo, yeah, that Galileo, was trying to apply for a patent for an irrigation pump. He noticed that his machine would only pump water about 10 meters, and that prompted him and other scientists to try to figure out why. In 1644, 50 years later, Evangelista Torricelli put mercury into a hermetically sealed tube. He flipped it vertically, and the mercury fell about 760 millimeters. That left an empty space at the top of the tube. Because this empty space could not have had any gas in it or matter in it, he called that empty space a vacuum. Four years later, in 1648, a Frenchman named Blaise Pascal hypothesized that if he were to take that same mercury tube to the top of a mountain, that the height of the column would decrease. He was right, discovering that the air at a higher elevation is actually less dense, or actually weighs less than at sea level. He was able to measure the weight of the air using these experiments. In 1656, the church became upset with Torricelli's findings of vacuum or nothingness, arguing that directly contradicted with the idea of an omnipresent god. So Otto van Gierke, a German scientist, decided to conduct an interesting and a little over the top experiment. He stuck two metal hemispheres together with a gasket of only grease. He then pumped as much air as possible out of this newly formed sphere and then attempted to pull these hemispheres apart using horses. Even with eight horses on each hemisphere, they couldn't be pulled back apart. Literally 16 horsepower. In 1820, French physicist and chemist Joseph Louis Gay-Lussac formulated Gay-Lussac's law, stating that if the mass and volume of a gas are held constant, then the gas pressure rises linearly as temperature rises. Finally, in 1843, Lucien Videt, a French scientist, invented and built the aneroid barometer, a spring-actuated measuring device. It took until the 1900s for several more types of air pressure measuring devices to be invented. All right, that was a lot of history that you probably didn't need to know, but I just thought it was interesting that as a species, we've went from wondering why water wouldn't keep getting pushed up a tube to literally discovering that pressure and temperature are directly related, which is a staple of understanding how the refrigerant cycle works. And we'll be talking about the refrigerant cycle in future videos for sure. Ultimately, throughout the 1900s, humans invented multiple renditions of mechanical and electrical actuating pressure switches. Also, manometers and refrigerant gauges, which are the tools that you'll need if you want to measure air pressure and refrigerant pressure. These switches can either close an electrical circuit during a rise or fall of pressure, or they can open an electrical circuit in those same circumstances. Normally, open pressure switches are commonly used on gas furnaces and some humidifiers. Normally, open switches are generally used as safety devices, like drain monitors and refrigerant pressure monitors. When it comes to gas or propane furnaces, most furnaces since the 1980s have been equipped with draft induction motors. You might hear me call it an inducer assembly, an inducer motor, a draft motor, draft assembly. They all mean roughly the same thing. It's a motor and a blower wheel to ensure that exhaust gases make it to the outdoors. We don't need to be huffing exhaust. Carbon monoxide is poisonous to humans, and we want that crap outside. When the call for heat begins at the thermostat, one of the first devices to come on is the exhaust motor. But we need to be able to know that the exhaust motor is running. 
not just running, but actually pushing the exhaust outside. And we accomplish this with the pressure switch. Again, using a gas or propane furnace as an example, the pressure switch is connected by a tube to the exhaust assembly or the collector box of the furnace, which can measure the negative pressure produced by the exhaust assembly, just like the negative pressure inside of a human's horse sphere. The pressure switch should have a rating on it, normally measured in inches of water column. Inches of water column is defined as the pressure exerted by a column of water of one inch in height at defined conditions. It's literally the amount of pressure that it takes to move a column of water one inch. And this is the tool used to measure that. Well, one of the tools you can use. Inches of water column or inches of water gauge are generally labeled in one of these 10,000 ways. I generally will use a quotation mark and the letters WC, and most technicians know that I'm talking about inches of water column, and it's relatively easy to type into my service notes. Regardless of how or if the switch is labeled, it will be rated for a specific positive or negative pressure rating in inches of water column. If the pressure switch port is located before the exhaust assembly, it's normally a negative pressure switch. And if it's located after the exhaust assembly, it's normally a positive pressure switch. There are some pressure switches that have two ports on them, and they connect to both the inlet and outlet side of the exhaust assembly. These are called differential pressure switches, and they measure the difference between the inlet and outlet pressure. If you were to take a manometer and connect it with a T into the pressure switch tubing, or even directly to the exhaust assembly pressure switch tubing port, you would read the pressure at which the air is being pushed or pulled through that tubing. The most common type of air pressure switch relies on the air movement through that tubing to either pull or push on a bladder inside of a plastic housing or if it's an older furnace, a metal housing. That bladder, as it moves up or down according to that pressure, actuates an electric switch. It will either open or close the contacts of that switch at the rated pressure. Some switches have normally open and normally closed contacts. Some have just one or the other. So aside from the pressure switch rating, make sure you've got the correct contacts on the replacement pressure switch. If the bladder tears, the housing cracks, or the electrical switch inside fails, it won't allow the furnace to operate anymore because it won't be able to monitor the exhaust pressure. So now you're in a client's home, it's cold in the house, you go down to the furnace and it's flashing a code 12, and you look at the little chart and that says, pressure switch did not close or failed to open. Easy, it's just a failed pressure switch, right? Wrong. 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 I used to have a long running joke with another technician. It's never the pressure switch. It's never lupus. Nowadays, it seems like with manufacturing defects being more common, just the quality of parts going down in general, it happens to be the pressure switch more often than it used to be. But it's still important to verify that that's what the problem is. The reason we made this joke is because 90% of the time, the previous technician that diagnosed a failed pressure switch would be incorrect. It was actually a plugged vent pipe, a plugged drain trap, or a plugged pressure switch port. Sometimes it was just lint inside of the little breather port on the side of the pressure switch. The real reason that it was an incorrect diagnosis is because the previous technician failed to find the real reason that the pressure switch wasn't closing. Just because the exhaust motor is running doesn't mean that the exhaust is going where it needs to go, or that the furnace knows that the exhaust is going where it needs to go. Sometimes on 80% furnaces, you'll get gunk on the inside of the pressure switch tubing port, and you have to actually remove the entire exhaust assembly to clean that off of there. But who has the time for that, right? So how can we be sure that it's the pressure switch that has failed? Again, connect your manometer to the exhaust tubing with a T, or even directly to the exhaust motor if you don't have a T, and reset the power to your furnace. Watch the pressure rise from zero inches of water column to hopefully above the pressure switch's rating. If the pressure doesn't ever rise above the pressure switch's rating, then the pressure switch is doing its job and there's another problem that's causing the pressure switch to not close. You can test to see if the switch closes electrically by putting your meter test leads on the two electrical connections for the pressure switch. 
Set your meter to read 24 volts AC. If the power is on and the switch is open, you should see a potential across those two terminals of about 24 volts. And when the switch closes, you should see that potential drop down to zero. You can also close the pressure switch manually by either blowing or sucking on the tube to cause that bladder to pull in or move out and close those electrical connections. You can then ohm out that switch to see what the resistance is through it. And if it's high, you might need to replace that switch as well. Don't blow or suck too hard because you don't want to tear a hole in that bladder. I've actually read a pressure on my manometer that was adequate, but the pressure switch still didn't close mechanically or electrically. However, if I actuated the pressure switch using a test tool, it would work just fine. I ended up finding out that the port on the inducer motor was just mostly plugged. It wasn't completely full, so I was still getting the correct draft pressure, but there wasn't enough air volume to pull that switch in. I've had a few furnaces, normally Nordine units, no shade to Nordine, where the burners would just cut out in the middle of a cycle, seemingly without a reason. At first I had thought this was because of a dirty flame sensor. It's a very common cause of an intermittent flame failure. However, I wasn't getting any sort of a code on the circuit board, and the unit would start right back up, it would never go into any sort of a lockout, and there didn't appear to be a reason for it. I had good flame signal, I had good draft pressure, everything looked okay. What I ended up finding out is that the pressure switch was fluttering. It would open for just a moment electrically, just enough for the gas valve to be shut off in the middle of the cycle and cause the cycle to start over again, but not long enough for it to actually throw a pressure switch code. So replacing the pressure switch actually fixed this, but I had no idea that it was cause the issue until I pulled out my meter and I was able to read that potential across the switch and see that momentary change in voltage through the switch when it fluttered. Luckily now, if those symptoms are happening, I'm aware of it and I can normally diagnose it a lot faster, but it took a little while the first time. I could give you an unlimited amount of examples and experiences that I've had over the past 15 years, but every service call with a potential pressure switch issue is circumstantial. And it's more important that you comprehend what's happening with the mechanics of the furnace so that you can eliminate the possibility of a vent restriction, a plug drain, a plug secondary heat exchanger before replacing the pressure switch. This applies to all diagnoses. Find out what the overarching issue is with the system before replacing any parts, because a part might be failing due to the improper setting of another part. You wanna do your due diligence as a technician to make sure that all of the system is operated properly that you're not just fixing today's issue, but possibly the issue that's causing today's issue. Similarly to a doctor, they measure your blood pressure every time you come in. You might have gone in for a cut on your finger, but they're still going to check to make sure that you're not about to have a heart attack. Because that's a more important problem to diagnose than the cut on your finger, which can be easily solved. So don't go into the house hoping to put a band-aid on it, Go into a house making sure that you're going through the system thoroughly to make sure you don't have any other potential more major issues that will bring you out a week, a month, or a year from now. If you're a homeowner that's experiencing trouble with your HVAC equipment, and if you live in Michigan, specifically Davison, Waterford, Lapeer, Oxford, North Branch, and the surrounding areas, then consider calling today's sponsor, Dal Air Heating and Cooling. You may have noticed the logo on my sweater, and possibly that my name is eerily similar to the name of the company that is sponsoring today's episode. Last October 2021, I made the decision to pursue my dream of owning and operating my own HVAC company. With 15 years of experience and a primary core value of focusing on teaching, I am confident that my company can not only provide high quality services to my clients, but also invaluable information about how their HVAC system operates and what the best solutions are for issues they may be experiencing or maybe issues they aren't even aware of. Visit our website, fixmyheat.com, for more information. Thank you so much for watching this one, guys. I have a script in the works right now for a video based on indoor air quality, but I'm most interested in finding out what you guys are interested in learning. Leave a comment below if you have any topic recommendations or anything you want to learn more about. 
If you feel that this video deserves a rating, please leave a like down below. Consider subscribing for more videos like this one, and check out our other videos. So it's been a while since I posted. Um, the last couple years have been a challenge for everybody, uh, myself included. I never had an issue with loss of work, which is a, a blessing. Um, I never had to worry about my next meal or paying my rent or, or anything like that. Um, which I can't say the same for a lot of people over the last couple of years. It really put into perspective the advantage that I have in the career that I've chosen, but also it put into perspective how much more I need to focus on being grateful for the things that I have, including my family. I spend a third of my time at work, a third of my time at home with my family, and the other third is spent unconscious in bed. You really don't get too much time with the people that you care about. I have always been a high performing technician, but I realized that it didn't make me feel fulfilled as a technician or as a human to just be the top selling technician. My priorities shifted to focus more on my family and focus more on providing high quality and inexpensive services to my community. I'm excited to be able to help people with not only HVAC problems, but indoor air quality issues and to teach technicians about this trade. My hope for the next few years is that this channel will grow, that I'll be able to share more ideas, more teaching opportunities to potential technicians, people who's coming out of high school, people looking for a career change, but also people who are do-it-yourselfers, homeowners that understand what I just talked about with pressure switches, and it's not a confusing issue for them. Now they know where to look because somebody was willing to tell them in a way that wasn't overly technical. Plus. I'm kind of a geek about this stuff. I've been doing this for 15 years. I don't just think it's cool that I can figure out that the pressure switch is bad. I think it's super cool that we even came up with the idea to monitor air pressure to ensure that the motor's running. That's the human innovation side of all of this is probably the best part. I, I think that it's amazing that we as a species have gotten to the point where we can do the things that we do so efficiently. So watch out for future videos. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed this one. Share it with your friends. I'm trying to get this channel to be a little bit larger so that I can share it with more people. But also interact with me. Uh, what do you want to learn? What do you want to know? I really want to help you guys learn more about the most important equipment in your home. The stuff that makes your home comfortable. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate you making it to the end of the video if you're watching this right now. Again, Consider subscribing, leave a like, and comment if you want to see any future videos.